Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Torvald Grongmo. Torvald is a 30-year veteran of the Nordisk Bank, the Central Bank of Norway, and also worked in the Norwegian Ministry of Finance, the World Bank, and the IMF. Torvald joins us today to discuss Marino Eccles in a paper he has written on him titled Marino Eccles and the 1950 Treasury Federal Reserve Accord, Lesson for Central Bankers. Torvald, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, David. Great to have you on. Now, you have been requested by a friend of the show, Sam Bell. Sam Bell found your paper on Mariner Eccles, and it was a great read, and we'll provide a link to it in the show notes. But you've got quite the career. You've worked at the Central Bank of Norway for three decades. You've worked at the IMF, the Ministry of Finance in Norway. You've worked at the BIS as well. Um, Tell us a little bit about your journey. It's a really fascinating one. Well, thank you. You know, I got into economics in the um, in the early '70s, actually, after finishing my military service, and uh, I didn't have grades to go into um, to the business school as my father wanted. So I started with economics, and was fortunate that at the time there was a good program at the University of Oslo. You may have heard about uh, Trygve Hovelmo, who was one of the Nobel Prize winners early on, together with Ragnar Frisch. Yep. Uh, Frisch was dead, but Hovelmo was one of my teachers, and um, it was a strong program in macro and econometrics. And then I wrote the thesis on development economics, so I had sort of a, a bit of a bias interested in in developing issues, but uh, I, I, I got my first job in the Minister of Finance. But then I was um, uh, called up by the World Bank and was accepted then in their young professional program. So I moved to the States and worked for five years at the World Bank, primarily on Africa as a country economist. And then I uh, moved back um, in the mid 80s and started working in the central bank. And, you know, uh, I, I actually stayed there for all those years working on uh various issues ranging from monetary policy to um, uh, financial stability issues primarily i was head of the financial stability report group for a while i was head of the governor's uh, office of strategic planning for a short while um but ended up doing quite a bit of work on payment systems and um and um related issues which you know, I know one, many of your guests has been into as well, the plumbing of the central banking, so to speak. And um, But during all these years, I, I should correct you, I, I never worked for the IMF, uh, uh, but I've been working as a consultant for, okay. consultant for them um, on, you know, how to organize central banks uh, in many parts of the world. Um, and, and I, um, well, and, and then... I, I retired uh, in, 19, in 2016 and has been a freelance academic since. Uh, one of the few, I say, because I have my pension and I, I don't have to, to, to uh, you know, uh, pro, to, to search for grants. And, um, uh, and then I'm work, freelancing for the IMF uh, as well. So, but I continue working on these issues. And, you know, as we discussed before the show, I mean, many of these issues are you know, really old issues. And one of my favorite writers is actually Henry Thornton. And I, I, I read his um, credit uh, paper money book from 1802, which is you wow. know, fabulous. And, yeah. and you sort of figure out that th- these are issues that has been with, it, with us for a long time. So you have worked with actually some of our previous guests, including Peter Stella, right? You mentioned you know him from work at the IMF. Yeah, we uh, we met um, initially at um, a mission to Azerbaijan way back. Uh, you know, this was after the um, Eastern Bloc countries had had um, had started looking for advice from the IMF. And, and so I, I joined them for a mission there. And then we worked together on missions in many countries like Jordan, Palestine, Paraguay, Bolivia, uh, 
around the world. Peter is a good friend and uh, is, a, is a really good guy. Um, I, I know he's been on your show as well. Yeah, and we could spend a whole show with you discussing your work on payment systems, operating systems, even talking about the Norges Bank, because it's a very fascinating central bank. It runs the pension fund, doesn't it, if I, if I understand correctly? Absolutely. So it does Absolutely. central banking, and it runs the big pension fund. So once I was looking at uh, data for central banks, and I noticed how big the Norwegian central bank's balance sheet was, I had to dig deeper <laughs> and parse out the part that's tied to monetary policy operations, and that's tied to the sovereign wealth fund. So very fascinating there. And as we talked about before the show as well, um, the Norges Bank has gone to a tiered operating system, kind of somewhere between a corridor and a floor system. So a lot of fascinating work happening at the Norwegian Central Bank. But today we're going to talk about Mariner Eccles. I do, however, want to take one detour into some of your other work because you've written a lot on shadow banking. And as you know, this crisis has seen shadow banking reemerge as an issue. Now, it's not the cause of the crisis, but it's been a part of, of the story that's happening. In particular, the Federal Reserve has stepped in in a major way with its liquidity facilities to deal with dollar funding pressures that emerged in March. So the Fed opened up you know, all the facilities it had in the previous crisis, as well as some new ones. In particular, I'm, I'm thinking you know, of the a dollar swap lines were extended to other central banks. The Fed also announced a new uh, repo facility for foreign central banks to deposit treasuries there, in addition to all the other liquidity facilities it has had. And, and you've written some work on shadow banking. And in fact, I think some very timely work that suggested that central banks like the Fed should be thinking carefully about how they respond and deal with shadow banking. Otherwise, you're going to have to keep doing what they did in this crisis. Can you speak to that briefly? Yes, just let me give you a little bit of background first, because, you know, this was a working paper that actually was written quite some time ago. It was revised later on, uh, but it, it, it was some work I did while at Levy Economic Institute on sabbatical in 2011-12. And um, the reason why I, I, I started working on this was twofold. One, because I went to Levy to study Minsky, Hyman Minsky. You know, he 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 sort of spent his um, last years there, and 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 uh, and the institute is sort of uh, preserving his heritage in a sense. And the person who actually um, you know got me into Minsky was Bill White at the BIS. I mentioned for you that I I did a, 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 a some work for them um, in the late '90s on macroprudential policies, and while there. Both he uh, or Bill White was was and uh, was into Keynes, so we discussed Keynes tract of monetary reform and stuff like that, and 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 then he he pointed me to Minsky and his fragility hypothesis, and and so that was the reason why I went to Levy. The other reason was uh, we're, we're working on shadow banking was that I had then for a while, for several years actually, worked on crisis resolution policies, and lender last resort policies in Norges Bank. And these issues came up uh, again and again. And, you know, I mean, obviously I read Badgett and, and, and studied the, the, the previous crisis. And, and then the more I thought about it, I, I felt that there was, you know, some tension in, in, the, in the way the official policy was portrayed and the demands, demand for, from the market. And, and rereading my paper now, I actually am surprised how well it stands um, by, by by the time uh, since it was written, because one of the question I posed was that, you know, um, central banks need to be very careful not to be dragged into, you know, further operations. This was written in 2012, analyzing the various alphabetic soup, uh, um, you know, uh, facilities that the fund created at that time. This time, <laughs> they have been even more aggressive and they've gone even further. And it's ironic that I ended one of my papers saying that central banks may have fixed the too big to fail problem for financial institutions, but they may be dragged into another um, market maker of last resort operations that they are not so willing to do. I mean, and, 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 and I think the events has sort of vindicated my conclusion and 
and and the issues are more relevant than ever as we've had as we've discussed on your show previously and it really is you know how far should the fed go in terms of validating markets uh, and and um, and and what are the limits and and i i discussed this in the paper including the collateral issues which you know is is sort of as tucker paul tucker once pointed out is it's a bit of an inconsistency because central banks argue that all their operations should be collateralized but if you look at the extent of operation or, or sup- of, of liquidity support obviously you have to glide on the quality on collateral in order to meet the demand of the market and so my my reflection was that you know somehow markets may be running ahead of us and 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 obviously in a crisis it's very difficult to do anything else at what the fed has done and they've get, gotten great praise for what they've done being so aggressive but i think the lessons from from my paper and also inspired by minsky is that maybe we need to think about the way we structure the financial system so that it doesn't happen again i mean uh, how can we get a more robust financial system without this you know need for market maker of last resort you know happening over and over again yeah that was that was the gist of the paper yeah a very interesting paper and we'll provide a link to it on the show notes but I, when I read it, it, it just seemed very almost prophetic that <laughs> you were outlining these problems and they reemerged here in this crisis on an even larger scale. I mean, the Fed had to step in. Dollar funding was under stress around the world. And it, if anything, it's just strengthened the hold of shadow banking system. So there is some need for thinking through how we deal with this in the future. Wait, can I just add a point? Yes. Because, you know, there are two versions of the paper. One was the original working paper, and then there is another one published uh, a fair deal later on. I think the development uh, I had, I mentioned to you that I worked on several committees uh, in the ECB and, and in Europe on, on you know, or defining shadow banking, how to, you know, get better insights and so forth. Um, and, and one of my realization was that this, the initial distinction between banking and shadow banking was false or misleading because and, and many others have since pointed this out and worked on it. These systems are, um, you know, intensely integrated, and and it would be mistaken to separate shadow banking from, from from the banking industry as such. And it relates much more to what uh, Muhammad Singh and and Peter Stella actually wrote about some way back that there there is this collateral space which is comprised of repo transactions. Of high rehypothecation, of favorable bankruptcy rule, et cetera, et cetera, that actually facilitate this development, and 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 so we need to look at it as as a coherent whole, rather than separate entities or separate issues. So it that brings me back to the sort of the need for regulating banks as well as shadow banks. Yeah, we just had on the show a uh, previous guest, Caroline Siseko. And she has written a paper on this very issue and how. The, oh, I, yeah, she is very good. I, I haven't heard that show. I'm yeah. going to listen. To it. Yeah, so Caroline has a paper where she talks about the history of the money market, how it's evolved from you know a unsecuritized, largely federal funds you know basis to almost entirely repo based money market. And what that has done is, is the very point that you've just raised about the importance of collateral and has made shadow banking and commercial banking tied. And so um, we will provide a link to that show as well. But she completely agrees with the point you just mentioned. You need to look at the challenges there. All right. Well, let's move on to the main focus of our conversation today. And that is your paper on Mariner Eccles and the uh, Fed Accord, 1951. And... It's a great paper, a lot of interesting um, stories in there. Um, you cover his, his policy work, both his early work, um, before he was at the Fed and then at the Fed. But I'm curious, how did you get into this topic at all? What, what led you down the path to want to look at Mariner Eccles? Uh, well, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a good question because it, would, it was absolutely not intended. I was intended to write something about Minsky. 
<laughs> and I ended oh, really? up writing about, uh, writing about Eccles. But the story goes like this. You know, I, I started out with, uh, with writing about shadow banking and, and fragile financial structures. And that actually um, led me to, um, to look at narrow banking as an issue. And then I stumbled upon Henry Simons and, and um, Irving Fisher, as you know. And there was a coincidence because uh, Minsky did his undergrad work at um, Chicago uh, in mathematics, actually. And then he moved on uh, to the economics faculty. And the economics faculty at that time comprised of, uh, you know, famous economists like um, uh, Paul Douglas and Weiner uh, and Oscar Lange, uh, but also uh, Frank Knight and um, Henry Simons, you know, and and. And Simons was actually uh, one of uh, Minsky's teachers, and he admired him a lot, even though they, you know, developed quite different um, theories. And then before the Eccles paper, I actually did a, an, another paper on reviewing uh, Simons' famous um, rules versus authorities paper, um, which, as you know, is sort of um, a very key reference for, uh, together with Kidlan and Presco, for the time inconsistency discussion and found there that um, Simons actually made strong references to the need for control of finance before you could have a viable monetary operating system. Anyway, that's a different story. But while reading about Simons, I also uh, stumbled upon the discussion um, of the Chicago group uh, for um, fiscal active fiscal policy in the early 30s. And this was interesting because that was at the time when Keynes actually advocated open market operation while visiting Chicago. But the, the Chicago group had written uh, in, in 33 and 34 papers actually advocating active fiscal policy to get out of the depression. And so through that work, I, I, I stumbled upon Eccles because then there were references to his statement in Congress in 33 which I, I, I found fabulous. I'm going to, you know, come back to that. And so I started reading about the guy. And then, you know, uh, today we have the St. Louis Fed, uh, you know, Fed files. So, you know, it's an easy way to get into FMOC uh, minutes and all that. And it, 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 it started me on a journey, which I really, really uh, found very interesting. In addition, that is, it related so closely to the critical discussion at that time of the need for more active fiscal policy. I mean, you might recall that uh, there was, after the crisis, a drive for active fiscal policy that was aborted because everybody thought we were out of the crisis. And I think it was in 2011, 12, that, you know, people, or, or sorry, countries sort of, um, uh, uh, retreated and 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 focused more on monetary policy. So all in all, I mean that was the background for starting on Eccles. Eccles um, is you know a fascinating and and rather uh, special story. Um, he was he became governor uh, of the Federal Reserve Board under FDR Roosevelt, um, but he was not destined to that in this, in any sense. He, he his father was a very very poor Scotsman who came to the U.S. Um, on a Mormon uh, grant. They were shipped to Utah, where he started in uh, lumber business and built up a fortune uh, during his lifetime. He died when uh, Mariner was twenty two. Uh, Mariner took over part of the business, but eventually took over most of his uh, business and uh, became a very prominent business person in his own. And during the early days of the Depression, he was he became famous for having saved his banking empire or banking conglomerate, one of the few actually who survived um, in the West. Uh, so that was his background. I got a question about that. So yeah, sure. He, he was the oldest of, well, nine siblings. He came from a Mormon family, so there were several wives involved. There was nine exactly. of his siblings from his mother. Then he had twelve other siblings from a, another wife. But he was the oldest, so he took over the business. Is that right? Because he was the oldest of all the children. He took only he he only took over 
I think two or three three sevenths or something. He he was he took over a, a minor part, but his business um, instinct was so much better that he ended up taking okay. over the whole. Um, but there are some stories in in um, one of his biographies uh, about you know how he was determined and aggressive in his early days. Uh, he purchased um, share in a milk company that started uh, you know his 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 his, his sort of fortune and uh it's it's fascinating story i mean really a wheeler dealer and yeah and, and you know a, a very very clever businessman yeah and you mentioned that he started the first bank holding company in the united states so he he built up his own little banking empire out west um and his banks actually survived the great depression i mean his banks did not shut down um, but th that's a nice, interesting segue into his introduction into thinking about the Great Depression. So it was really neat reading how he observed his clients, people in his community, and they were all struggling. And he he came to the, a a theory of you know business cycles, and and you know it struck me wh why him? Why did he why did he come to this conclusion? I mean, he again he was observing the pain and the suffering around him. I wonder, though, if, if many people back then were thinking about this. I mean, if you're living through the Great Depression, you're trying to understand why. Why all hmm. this pain and suffering? I imagine others, but, but he, unlike others, formulated an idea. And what was, I mean, probably the most fascinating part of this paper, he was like Keynesian before there was Keynes, right? He yeah, believed true. in countercyclical uh, macro policy before Keynes wrote his work. Yeah, that's true. But as I alluded to with his uh, with Henry Simons and the Chicago School, he didn't operate in a vacuum. Although he was not an academic, and there are questions as to whether he read anything about you know those uh, statements from the Chicago economist. Um, but I think there is a combination of two things. One is he had a very strong work ethic and a very strong moral uh, sentiment. He he was very righteous. And so I think uh, he he reacted uh, when, and he was very active in charities. So, you know, w during the depression and in Utah in particular, he observed how they did try to do their best, uh, but it just didn't, uh, it just wasn't enough. And so that was part of it that he sort of gradually recognized that somebody else has to sort of get, get the thing sorted out. And his answer was that the government needs to step in. Um, in terms of the analytics, I think um, there there is some indication that he was he, that he had read some of the underconsumptionist theory th oh, okay. theorists. I don't recall the names, but you know these were pamphlets that circulated in the late nineteen twenties and and early thirties, and there are indication that he had read some of this. So he was sort of developing his his views on countercyclical policies in terms of the state having to compensate for shortfall in private consumption but in a sense i mean i you know these days there is a lot of discussion about mmt and modern monetary theory i i would actually say that some of his views are in anticipation of some of that mmt stuff um because he he clearly had a balance sheet perspective on on how the economy works, so um, so that was interesting. Yeah, you know, you, you mentioned he, he testified before Congress in the early '30s, and one of the concerns he had is he really disliked FDR's calls for a balanced budget, and he yeah. he really I mean he really pushed back. In fact, you mentioned he was called a socialist because of this. But but it, again, if you look at his background, he comes from kind of you know. Very, as you mentioned, very righteous man. You take care of yourself. You work hard. You do things right, and everything works out. And he saw that wasn't happening in the early '30s, um, so he began to think broader. And maybe he read these pamphlets, as you mentioned. But he had a a, a view of, of a business cycle, a, a countercyclical view of macro policy for the business cycle. And it was just interesting to to hear him in his own words, because you quote him. I'm, I'm going to read this that he understood the fallacy of viewing a government budget as a household budget. And you, you, I'm going to quote him here from your paper. You say, he says, We borrow from ourselves, and, and when we pay interest on our debt, we pay it back the principal to ourselves. We are paying ourselves. And he goes on, and, and so you, you talk about how he understood how government finance is different than household finance which must have been very original at the time. I mean, were other people making this point or was he kind of unique? 
and making this argument in the early 30s? No, I think he was somewhat unique, although, again, there were some of these thoughts were around in the academic circles, but I don't think he was very much aware of that. Uh, no, he was somewhat of a character. And I would say that, I mean, you can ask the question, why, why Eccles? Why Eccles today? I mean, why bother? But I think rereading Eccles and 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 it's it's so inspiring for our current situation, or as you'd rather say, your situation, because with the country in the in the pandemic, and the Congress sort of stalemate and 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 discussions about support measures and stuff. Let me just quote what he said to Congress in '33, and you know I should add that he was called as a witness at the end. And all the others, 120 something, was prominent business people, everybody saying that we need to balance the budget to create business sentiment that's good for investment. And here comes this millionaire or billionaire from the West and and and, and making these statements. And and the reason they're interesting is that they could they they could and should actually, in my view, uh, be relevant uh, also for today. And I, I I'll just list them very quickly. He said first provide ample funds for all states to be used for the destitute and the unemployed. Um, two, allocate funds for public works to cities, counties, and states on a liberal basis at low rates. And then he had a point on agriculture pricing and production, which is not relevant today. Fourth point was refinance mortgages on an um, increased scale at long-term basis with low rates. And finally, and this was related to the interwar um, um, settlement of, of, of debt, a permanent settlement of the sovereign debts on a sound basis, cancellation being preferable. I mean, all of these are really, really something that, you know, should be applied today uh, in the current situation. A very Not radical least, for back then, though, right? It was a very radical view. Very radical. And yeah. uh, as you can imagine, I mean, he... And again, imagine he was at this time still uh, in charge of his business empire, I should say, and his shareholders weren't um, uh, absolutely um, happy with his views, obviously. And um, he was a Republican, by the way, I mean, by, by party affiliation, not active, but I mean, um, so eventually when, uh, you know, he, he, he went to Washington and, and obviously there were people around FDR who pick up uh, his views and and it uh, the fact that he was a prominent business person made him all the more interesting because it was a, it wasn't some you know uh, weirdo uh, coming out of the west it was a really i mean i think he was the richest person west of the rockies at the time so he wasn't some academic with you know in, in the ivory towers coming up with some no, crazy absolutely. radical theory he was a a capitalist absolutely. he was a capitalist absolutely a Mormon, a conservative, very, you know, much a, you know, a righteous man of the faith. And here he is with these radical views back then, very well, radical. He was a capitalist with a, with a heart at the right place. I a heart in the so, right so, place, yeah. yeah. Now, I just want to, so just to reiterate, so he had a view, he, he came to a view that there's a place for counter-cyclical macroeconomic policy. And you mentioned he had a term, um, a phrase, he said, you need to counteract or compensate, government needs to provide a compensating force um, in the economy. So, I mean, it, it sounds very much like a, probably a modern view of, of counter-cyclical macroeconomic policy. And I'll also mention, even though he called, and we'll get to this in more detail later in the show, but even though he pushed back against FDR's calls for a balanced budget, he ultimately believe in balancing over the business cycle, right? Balancing the budget mm. over the business mm. cycle. So he, he wasn't just, let's run budget deficits for ev forever. He was saying, look, during a recession, a downturn, you want to do that. So he had a nuanced view. And finally, the other th thing I want to highlight before we move on to his career in D.C. is that his his view of the Great Depression, so he it was a view about aggregate demand being a shortfall, but he had a, a unique view in that he stressed that this... this Collapse in demand was tied to the overextension of credit, which in turn was tied to income inequality. And when you're reading this, you're like, man, this is like a 1930s version of Sufi and Mion and their book on housing debt and the collapse in the 2008 crisis. So 
he sounded very similar to what many people were saying in t what was going on in 2008, which, again, it's just interesting to see someone way back then making these points that were echoed again in the last crisis. But again, I would say it's even more sort of relevant today than in 2008 in the sense that the disparities and income distribution has worsened even more. And he made the point, actually, he was, you know, mind you again, he was he was super rich. So, you know, he was actually adv advocating policies that would hurt himself, but he was advocating strong progressive taxation. And he made the point that, you know, um, income going to the rich doesn't generate uh, consumption and so because they save so much so i mean there is no there is no effective demand coming out of them anyway i mean looking from a macro perspective so he had very progressive views uh, absolutely and and again they're i mean very relevant for today one more thing about his personal life before we move on is that uh, Vice Chair of the Federal Reserve, Randy Quarles, is related to him, I know. right? At his Randy's wife is in Eccles, is that right? Uh, his his wife is a grand niece okay. of Eccles. Yeah. yeah, so she's in Eccles. I heard that the other day. Yeah, so, yeah so in, in, interesting um, coming full circle here. We have an Eccles. Actually, can I can I interject yes. one point there? Because there is one thing that it's not prominent in my paper, which but which I discovered we reading now preparing for this is that one of the things Eccles was very strongly in favor of was unitary banking. He was very upset by the division of, 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 of responsibility for supervision between OCC, um, FDC, FDC uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Fed. And he tried over and over again to get FDR to allow him to sort of do something with this in Congress. But FDR didn't want to take the 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 sort of the battle. I mean, he had enough to to deal with. But but you know, this is again related to you know the I, I guess his new position in the Fed is is the wise chair for supervision, right? That's correct. Uh, so um, it it sort of just reminded me of the yeah the, no it is ever, interesting. Ever, this ever, never ending discussion about supervisory right. responsibility in the U.S. So anyway, so. Vice Chair Quarles is both, you know, fallen in, in Mariner's legacy on many levels. He's at the Federal Reserve. He's engaged in banking regulation, like, and concerned about the similar issues. So it's just, it's fascinating to see this this connection there and how it runs in the family. And of course, the Federal Reserve building is named the Eccles Building after him. So fascinating backstory. But let's move on to his his actual career in D.C. So we already mentioned he came and gave testimony as a businessman. And that kind of put him on the, on the map. Um, but, but tell us, how did he get into, you know, FDR's government? What, what pulled him up there? What role did he play? And, and how did that provide a segue into the Federal Reserve? Yeah. Um, when he, um, uh, when he uh, after he gave his testimony, he went up to um, New York and met some of the people connected with FDR. Um, included Tugwell and some others um, who were close to FDR. And and they discussed primarily uh, without any commitments to anything, but then he went back to Utah and I guess, uh, and, 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 in, and there he listened in dismay to, you know, FDR's uh, continued the preaching of balanced budget, but, you know, he couldn't do much with it there. there. And then um, eventually he was called uh, to meet some of um, the same people again. So he went back and, and, and had meetings and uh, what finally uh, uh, emerged was an offer to join in the, ministry, in the treasury um, under Morgenthau. And he said, well, he wasn't really prepared to give up his business interests. And so he went back and sorted out things with his brother and so forth. And then uh, he was appointed uh, assistant uh, to the treasury secretary. In uh, yeah, in in nineteen thirty three four or something, I don't recall exactly the date. And um, and there initially he was asked to do sort of odd odd pieces of work within the ministry, but but soon he was heavily involved in the new Housing Act. And that was interesting from a banking perspective because it sort of opened up the potential for commercial banks to get into the mortgage business. 
And before that, there had only been balloon loans. And then they uh, sort of, I mean, actually, there was an assistant to, to Marion Eccles called Lachlan, who uh, actually invented the mortgage in a sense and, and, and enabled commercial banks to go into mortgage business on a wide scale. Um, and while working on that, he um, met FDR on a couple of occasions. And then at one point, he said he heard rumors that he was considered for the post of the vacant governor of the Board of, um, Board of Federal Reserve. And uh, eventually, he met with FDR, uh, and who told him, well, Mariner, uh, are you prepared to take the post? And he said, <laughs> Flatly, he refused flatly and said, I wouldn't touch it at all unless there are major reforms made to the system. And, 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 and FDR got intrigued and asked him, well, what, 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 what's your proposals? And so he said, give me a couple of days. And then he went back uh, with a proposal that eventually emerged as the um, uh, ref banking, uh, banking Act of 1935. Title II of Banking Act. And um, so that was, you know, the way he en ended up in the, um, in, in the Federal Reserve. Um, I should add that, as you know, uh, Senator uh, Glass was the original founder of the um, Federal Reserve Act in 1913. He was still at the, in the Senate. And there were two unfortunate incidents that sort of um, made life a bit miserable for, for Eccles. One was that FTR... Uh, when nominating him for the post of governor, uh, failed to inform Glass beforehand. And Glass was very upset about this. So he said, <laughs> he's, not, he's not going to get the post over my dead body. And the second was in terms of the 1935 Banking Act and, you know, changing his baby uh, legislation. That was sort of also, also um, to be a difficult um, uh, process because uh, contrary to Eccles' promise of showing him a draft uh, legislation, uh, the legislation was made public before either of them had seen it, and or the draft publication. And Glass was was heavily upset. So it was a tough fight to get it through Congress. Um, but just on the substance, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Eccles' point was at the time. The District Federal Reserve Bank actually had the upper hand, and the board was, you know, really, really not a very strong body, and and that was um, that was uh, indicated by, you know, one of the governors actually choosing to go back to his regional bank rather than staying uh, in Washington. So uh, it didn't really have much, uh, you know. Uh, influence on, 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 on monetary policy, if you could call that monetary policy at all. It wasn't really centralized. And so what uh, the key changes that, um, that uh, Eccles proposed was to concentrate power in the hands of the board. And, and obviously, again, this was, um, this was uh, resisted by the regional banks, as well as something called the Advisory Federal Reserve Board, or a committee, which was private bankers from the regions advising the board. And, and they said, you know, you can't do this. And, and Eccles just said, this is what, what I'm going to do. You like it or not. So we get this new system, which is sort of carried forward to these days of, of open market operation being centralized at the board in the open market committee. The authority to set reserve requirements also with the board and, and the new collateral policies, which, by the way, were quite instrumental in financing quite a bit of the war effort in terms of the um, treasuries being being uh, introduced as new collateral for 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 monetary operations. So uh, that's how we ended up there. And actually, there was a complete new board uh, established um, with new candidates. Um, and everything was eventually approved by Congress. But again, as we have seen over and over, I mean, the, the establishment of the Federal Reserve in 1913, as you know, again, is a close race between different fractions and a lot of infighting. And here again, there was a tied vote for Eccles as governor, which was eventually, you know, um, 
uh, tilted in his favor and the banking law uh, um, title two was only ex um, 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 accepted by Congress after a direct intervention by FDR. So all of these things sort of hang in a balance uh, often. So it's fascinating to read the story because he helped redesign the Fed effectively. He made the Fed what it is today, more or less. Um, and then he went on to run it. He wasn't just a governor, he was chair from 1934 to 1948. So imagine designing an institution and then you get the helm, you're in charge, you get to lead it. So Absolutely. fascinating. Absolutely. I mean, and, and it is, it's this history, we got to move on, but the history is so neat here that the regional banks used to set monetary policy, right? So um, you know, the famous story of Benjamin Strong being pivotal to the early fight in the Great Depression. Yeah, he yeah. dies. What do you do? There's no central leadership. So this is one of the reasons, you know, that uh, Mariner Eccles wanted to consolidate power in D.C. So he got he got the power in D.C. He got more securities, the collateral point you mentioned, and, and pulled the power away from the regional banks. You also mentioned he was concerned about New York banks having a lot of power and trying to bring it all to D.C., so he, he's made it to office. He made it through Senator Glass, who he irritated. Um, the next part of the story is getting us... So we get through the Great Depression. Well, we're still, we're still in the Great Depression, technically, until the end of the 1930s. World War II starts. But we're getting near the end of the Great Depression, and uh, financing for World War II becomes an issue. So, so talk about war financing and the Fed's, um, you know support of it and how it led eventually to this interest rate peg well um you know the the the, the peg as you know has been has become more uh, relevant lately because uh, of the recent policies enacted by many uh, central banks of yield control i mean initially by bank of japan and then eventually by others and I don't think many had heard about the World War II peg before that, or at least hadn't been that much interested in it. Um, and again, as an aside, I remember when I started in the central bank in the mid-80s, you know, the, the thinking was that you control the short rate and then the market decide uh, the yield curve. Um, but as you say, during the initial years of uh, World War II, 42, there was an agreement between uh, the Fed um, and the Treasury that they would finance their paper uh, at given prices. And so I think uh, the short end was three eighths and um, then the long rate was two, two and a half. I think Meltzer in his book about Federal Reserve actually discussed this and, and and asked why two and a half, um, and that's because UK had three at the time. Uh, you know, Keynes was again famous for writing about this, how to finance the war, uh, which is an interesting pamphlet again uh, related to this issue. And um, um, and Melster also alludes to that there was no formal agreement actually as two and a half. It was sort of more of a, a tacit understanding. But it became the, the the norm, and 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 then the other issue was how much to uh, finance with taxation and how much with bond sales. And this was where there were differences between countries, and I don't recall the exact proportions. But again, in the UK, they had a larger proportions of taxation than in the US, and in addition they had a larger proportion of bond financing to the public. Whereas in the US, uh, a lot of the financing ended up being financed uh, by banks. Uh, and, and so um, Eccles eventually started being concerned about the buildup of excess reserves. Again, you could sort of draw a parallel to today and quantitative easing where you know, the same discussions goes in terms of the inflationary consequences of excess reserves. But at, at least at that time, they, um, they, they, Eccles started being concerned about this early on in, in the 40s, uh, much earlier than anybody else. And he started talking about it as well. And, and they were discussing various ways to sterilize by, ex, uh, you know, introducing new, new reserve requirements and so forth. But contrary to many who who was afraid of a contraction after the war, uh, Eccles was, and rightly so, uh, concerned about uh, inflation and 
excess demand. And, and he wrote, he actually had a lot of uh, figures and, and speeches about excess liquidity building up in the system and, you know, what would happen eventually. And he, he made the point that the need for controls was even larger after the war, immediate after the war than during the war to counteract these inflationary forces. Wage and price controls? Yeah, they were obviously um, in effect during the war. Yeah. But uh, I mean, uh, without getting into too much detail, you know, you had the transition to a new president and Truman right. was was pressured from many, many um, sides. And, 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 and Eccles specifically was, was, um, was in favor of continuing the excess profit tax uh, and also retaining some of the price uh, and wage controls until you know the situation had calmed down. But but due to political pressure, Truman was sort of forced into abandoning these, and and the immediate result was a, a, a hike in inflation, uh, which sort of indicated Eccles' views. So Eccles was concerned that as long as the Fed had to continue the interest rate pegs, and you mentioned. Long-term pegs were bonded at two and a half percent, and then Treasury bills at three eighth or 0.375 percent. Long as the Fed had to continue supporting those pegs after the war had ended, he was concerned about inflation that they were creating all this, you know, support for fiscal policy, monetizing the debt, and there would be this inflation takeoff. So as long as the Fed was doing that, and as you said, he wasn't comfortable doing it, but as long as the Fed was doing it, then he felt there should still be offsets in terms of wage and price controls and profit taxes. But he, he didn't get those because of, of political reasons. And just one little side note on this, the, there was a, 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 an act, the Second Wars Power Act of 1942, which you noted in your paper, and this act allowed the Fed to buy directly from the Treasury. So yeah, it, it could yeah. be direct kind of, you know... Article, article 14B. <laughs> yeah, directly could buy... buy. The thing is, it... it, it Lasted, which was interesting, and, and until 1981, it didn't. Those that power no. wasn't removed until 1981, and I think this is an, also an important lesson for today as well. From this, this story, it's a small one, but you know, last year in September when we had the repo rate spike, when some of the plumbing issues came to a head from the operating system and bank regulations, um, w- one solution that George Selgin proposed. <laughs> was allowing the Fed to buy directly through a, a repo facility from the Treasury, at least in emergency times, to, to kind of take off some of this pressure. It would have solved some of the problems. Um, and, you know, in, in having this conversation, you know, I, I, I talked to some people from Canada, some officials there, and, and they noted that, you know, the Bank of Canada actually buys a small percent of all the new debt I issue, know. which is I fascinating. Know. And I think that kind of helps... The plumbing sum. I mean, that's the argument. It facilitates a- activity there, and the Fed could do this and, up and until eighty one. And you could add that the um, the recent um, the recent change in the operating procedure of Bank of England also facilitated direct purchases, although on a on a on an ad hoc basis. But yeah, I make the point in the paper, and 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 as you've read the whole thing, I mean, one of my concern. And one of the motivation for writing the paper was that, you know, I, I, I read a lot about central banking independence and all these things and collateral policies. And, and as you've noted previously on your show, you had a good discussion on collateral policies in the U.S. and, and, and the Eurozone. And, 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 and as I, I write, there are structural differences between countries, Japan, Europe and U.S. and the U.K. That, that sometimes has an impact on what is the right setup. And again, on central bank independence, Eccles' point was that, you know, these things, and as I conclude in my paper, shouldn't be set in stone. I mean, there there are some general principles, but, you know, I think we should be careful of not becoming overly doctrinaire and and too rigid in in our policy making. And so my my conclusion in, in following Eccles, as you as you've read, is that, you know, central bank uh, policies should be adapted to the circumstances and not necessarily, you know, be cast in stone. Like, you know, I have some quote from Peter Pratt, formerly with the ECB, uh, 
and where you know the treaty has has uh, has sort of put these principle in stone to never be touched despite the cyclical circumstances which i think is crazy i have to say that and so again uh, these are sort of issues that i think are open for discussion and as you said there could become a crisis situation where you know you should open up for direct purchases if that's the way to save the system yes yeah, absolutely. I mean, I want to be clear, there's a danger, and and this is the concern and why you don't see it today in the U.S., is that you don't want the Fed buying up debt all the time from the Treasury and you know, on a sustained basis. But I think George's suggestion was in emergencies, you have a facility that opens up and would allow this to happen. So you're right, you need to set it according to each country's unique situation. But Nonetheless, an interesting side story that the Fed could buy directly mm. from the Treasury up through 1981 from this yeah. period. Yeah. So, which today seems just so foreign, so so different than what, what we do. Okay, so we have the situation emerging here. Inflationary pressures are building. The Fed's getting concerned. And, and Eccles is, is echoing his concern. And what happened to Mariner Eccles that he lost his chair position in 1948? Just a comment on the on the accord. Uh, I mean, I have some quotes there. People saying it's the you know biggest battle in central bank history, uh, and the story in itself, without regard to the policy implication, is just fascinating. But you know, a lot of politics is. I I um, I mean, just to state the facts first. Uh, you know, Eccles was um, a chairman of the board, and then. He, uh, when FDR died and Truman came on, he went to Truman and said, and and sort of offered his position and said that you know I can understand if you want to have a new ch chairman uh, that you would designate yourself. And Truman said, no, I want you to stay on. And then time went by and Eccles became more vocal in in his opposition to uh, you know this um, this inflationary policies after the war. And without really any warning, he was he was um, he was told that he wouldn't he, he his his position wouldn't be renewed, uh, and he was very upset and 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 he asked to have a talk with the president, and Truman was clearly uh, sort of um, uncomfortable and didn't really want to give him a straight answer. But there are various stories about that, um, and. Um, and one is that he he, he always sort of um, was a bit of a, um, a, a provocative person with his views. So people, you know, could use that as an argument. But there is another story, which is a side story, actually, um, about his um, his his um, uh, related to his uh, banking supervision practices. There was a banking conglomerate on the west. Uh, in addition to his own, that was uh, Bank Transamerica, uh, the parent company of the later Bank of America. And he had been uh, pursuing, you know, regulatory action um, uh, with them for many years. And 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 there was great tension. And, and many of, of Truman's friends had relations to this company. So there are some, with some speculation that there, that could have been one part in in the Truman's decision. Another one, which is probably more likely, is that there was at the time uh, of this um, supervisory issue hearings in Congress, where Eccles testified, and they pushed him on his business holdings and his business relations, and 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 definitely Eccles had divested a lot while becoming chairman, but, you know, he still retained some business interests um, uh, out West. And Truman wrote a note never to be released to Eccles, but since found in his, um, in his library, where he actually noted that Eccles uh, spent too much time with his business dealings and had a conflict of in potential conflict of interest. That was enough for him to, you know, lose that position, and if not more. So, I think that may be the more. Okay. Uh, more so it's 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 sort of interesting. Anyway, he he uh, he was told that he would not be renewed as chairman, and then you, as you know, the interesting twist of this story is that people then expected him to leave, uh, 
Yeah, but he didn't. The board, but he didn't. He was he was offered informally the vice chair position by Truman, and he said, "I would accept that." But that offer never materialized, and so eventually, Eccles decided to stay on the board as a regular member. Uh, and asked Truman to have his name withdrawn as as candidate for the vice chair, which was never filled anyway. So contrary to what many expected, he was he continued on the board um, up until fifty one, which we'll come to when he was. Yeah. On. Now this is fascinating because you couldn't imagine anyone doing that today, right? Like for example, when Paul Volcker kind of lost his role as chair, he left. He had time left on his, I believe, his term. Yeah. Why would you stick around after being a very influential chair and then, you know, someone else becomes takes that role? But Torvald, this has been a very inter- interesting story. And we, we need to actually get to your, your lessons from the Treasury Court. So just to summarize what happens next. So Eccles loses his spot. Um, President Truman appoints Thomas McCabe and he ends up disliking Thomas McCabe as much. In fact, you have a, a point in there where you mentioned that that President Truman was disappointed in him. And, and actually, there's another lesson here we can't spend time on, but, you know, President Truman asked Thomas McCabe to resign, which kind of, you know, has echoes of President Trump and Fed Chair Powell, the tension there. So it wouldn't be the first time a president has asked a Fed Chair to resign. But m- moving on forward, we, we find, you know, there's there's this tension. Um, the Fed and the, and the president think they have an agreement. The president releases, or the Treasury Secretary releases a... A, a speech where, you know, he says the Fed's going to continue to support the Treasury's policies. The Fed gets upset. And in fact, Eccles plays a role here. He releases um, a letter and, and comments to the newspaper, which which really you know, kind of builds momentum. And eventually, anyhow, we have the, the 1951 Treasury Federal Reserve Accord where, you know, the Fed breaks away from the Treasury and we have this glory story of independence. You know, independence is achieved. There's a lot more to the story there. You can read it in the paper. But what were the lessons you took away from this, both th- this particular incident and more generally the lessons from Mariner Eccles' life? What what should we take away? Because there is the standard story about, oh, the wonderful independence of this 51 agreement. But there's a broader story you want to tell. So tell our listeners what it is. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, the first... Uh, Eccles is just a fascinating person, as, and, and as I said, I think his lessons broader than central banking is is applicable to the current situation, and his 1933 testimony for the Congress is really uh, worth rereading. But regarding central banking, I think it's interesting that there are so many, uh, there are so varied, uh, uh, widely different lessons drawn from the Accord. My point has been that you know the Accord is often seen as a sort of um, basis for current central bank independence policies. I think that is too narrowly defined, and Eccles proves the point that, you know, there is um, there is a broader issue here in terms of, uh, you know, adjusting the policies um, uh, to fit the, the cyclical situation. Um, and also, I think, there, has, there is the uh, the underlying issue of coordination between the Treasury and the Central Bank, which is, you know, uh, something that has been treated in the um, literature a lot uh, of Central Bank independence. But I mean, again, reference to Woodford and, and, and the Sergeant and Wallace paper, um, which sort of seems to indicate that if you can balance the fiscal bu- budget, the Central Banks can be left to uh, sort of control the price level. But that is, again, I think, um, too narrow a view. And, and, and recent recent speeches by including Woodford, but actually at the ECB research conference the other day, uh, I think now realizes the need for or recognizes the need for active fiscal policy, at least in the current circumstances. Uh, what more? Um, Actually, uh, one of my conclusion is that maybe nominal uh, GDP targeting is yeah no hey is, uh, I, I love it's a solution and I I actually had forgotten that until I read it on page sixty seven of my paper which I thought oh David would like this do you, now do you think so, Mariner Eccles would support nominal GDP targeting is that consistent with his view yeah okay I actually I do think so I mean his view of compensatory um, uh, policies would clearly be a variation of that. Uh, what I quote in the paper is somebody else, I think Frankel or somebody uh, 
who has a nominal GDP target of some four or five percent, which I think also is consistent with the current discussion of maybe you know you should allow for more inflation. I mean, ref the recent revision by Fed of of uh, or overshooting. Um, another lesson, important lesson, uh, again inspired by Minsky, is that. Uh, you know, and going back to the shadow banking discussion is you won't get any stability if you don't have some con better control of the financial system. I think Benjamin Friedman actually made the point after the previous crisis that we need to have a serious look at the uh, financial system, whether it allocates capital adequately. And he was sort of saying we need to look at this pragmatically uh, if the current system is is the way we want to be or or not. And I think that for me is a, is is an important issue and and for those interested they can read the shadow banking paper for more detail and then finally what should i say that again monetary policies should not be set in stone i mean this this um um uh, is something that history again has shown various over over time and i think there is um, an, an, a quote for from an economist historian who says the present form of central banking is certainly not the only viable institutional solution. And the same goes for debt monetization. I mean, if you look at history, this goes in cycles. So my view is that, you know, Eccles has very important lessons for us uh, in central banking policy specifically, but more widely so for economic policy. And he should be read and, you know, you can find more detail in my paper. <laughs> yeah, it's a great paper. And we will, again, provide links to it in the show notes. I encourage our listeners to take a look at it. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Torvald Grongmo. Torvald, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Dave. It's been fun. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.